Hi, I'm Dr. Leslie Blankenship Williams, and in this lecture, we are going to learn about endosporulation. Now, most bacteria, when they die, that's the end of it. But some bacteria have this unique capacity to, in a way, kind of live indefinitely through this endosporulation cycle. Now, not very many bacteria can do this, but a few can. Now, this process of making an endospore is almost like a time capsule of your own genetic information. So the basic idea is this. A bacterial cell decides that it's gonna go through this endosporulation process, and they take their DNA and they wrap it up in a tough protective shell that protects it from the harsh environment of the world, like, dryness, bacteria don't like to be dry, so dryness or disinfectants or heat like boiling water, and it protects that genetic information. And so if a spore lands on a hospitable tissue, like let's say the lung tissue, it'll sense warmth and wet and, you know, good conditions and it will actually break open and a new vegetative cell will emerge, an identical copy of the previous vegetative cell. So in this really interesting way, you can have a single cell with its unique genetics kind of go through this cell, spore, re-germinate into a new cell, create a new spore process indefinitely. Okay, so let's talk about which bacteria are capable of doing this. There are not many but the two that are are clinically significant, and they belong to the uh, genera Clostridium and Bacillus. So you will need to know this for your exam. So Clostridium and Bacillus are both what are called spore formers because they are capable of going through this sporulation process. Clostridium includes several pathogenic members. Perhaps the most common of them is Clostridium difficile, sometimes known in slang as C. diff. So if you've ever heard of a C. diff infection before, that's Clostridium difficile. And as we're gonna learn a little bit later, the fact that it makes spores is part of what makes it so difficult to eradicate from hospitals. Bacillus also contains a few pathogenic members, and one of which is Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax. So what we're gonna do now is cover the process of sporulation. So go ahead and get out a pen and paper and draw along with me. A typical bacteria cell that is metabolically active is known as a vegetative cell. Now, when vegetative cells experience good conditions like warmth and nutrients and water, they will divide and produce daughter cells that are also vegetative. This process of cellular division that bacteria do is known as binary fission. It starts by replicating the chromosome, and then each copy of the chromosome migrates to opposite ends of the cell. The cell then pinches off in the center to create two identical daughter cells. So when we talk about bacterial growth, what we're actually talking about is bacterial division by binary fission. Now, most bacteria, when they encounter unfavorable conditions, will just stop growing or die. But endosporulating bacteria are capable of forming endospores. So when conditions get tough, they'll actually start the sporulation process instead. Now, this process looks a little bit like a binary fission when you start because a vegetative cell, which remember is going to be a cell that is metabolically active, will start by replicating its DNA which might seem a little bit counterintuitive, like why would you want to replicate your DNA if you're just going to die? But they do this for, on, on purpose. We're going to let one copy of that DNA get packaged in the spore. But imagine if I were to ask you to make a time capsule and inside the time capsule you were to put the instructions for how to make the time capsule and the first step said put instructions in time capsule and you go okay i put the instructions in the time capsule now what well i don't know because my instructions are in the time capsule i don't know what the next step is so we have to keep a copy of dna outside of the forming spore that you can keep reading off of so that you can finish making your spore 
All right, once you uh, copy your DNA, one copy will be the spore DNA, and then you're going to surround that DNA with all kinds of goodies that are gonna be needed for the next vegetative cell. So those goodies are gonna be like ribosomes and enzymes and sugars and nutrients. So once you do that, now you're going to basically coat the spore in a very, very tough protective coating called a spore coat. And so that spore coat has a bunch of layers to it and is really tough. So think like a really tough seed shell as kind of an, an example of what that might look like. And once you do that, now the vegetative cell is basically done. And so the vegetative cell will degrade and lyse, releasing the endospore. Now this is kind of a weird terminology shift. When the spore is still in, contained in the vegetative cell, it is called an endospore. But once the endospore is released from the vegetative cell, we just call it a basic spore. Functionally, it's the same thing. So don't get confused between the term spore and endospore. Okay, now that you're back, this is a, a prettier picture of basically the same process of sporulation. And again, I want to reiterate that when you have a metabolically active cell, it is called a vegetative cell. And when it makes a spore, the spore is metabolically inactive. When the spore is encased in the vegetative cell still, we call that an endospore. And when it's released, it is actually just called a spore. So now that we've covered that, let's take a look at why would bacteria do this? So in addition to being able to kind of live indefinitely, um, the advantage of spores is that it protects the genetic information um, when times are tough. So it protects the cell or what will be a new cell from harsh conditions such as disinfectant, boiling water, and dryness. And we have been able to successfully germinate spores that are over 5 million years old. So that's pretty substantial. So this confers a huge advantage to bacteria. So if you take a bunch of bacteria and some of them are spores and then you boil the water, all the vegetative cells will die, but the spores will persist. So spore forming bacteria are particularly difficult to eradicate from hospital settings because spores are very, very difficult to kill. Other bacteria, like Staphylococcus, do not form spores. So if you have a, what's called a non-spore forming bacteria, of which most bacteria are non-spore forming, then something like boiling water should kill everything and eradicate the bacteria from that, that container. Okay, we are going to take a look at a quick video that shows the germination process. So this video is going to show you the germination process of these bacteria. So here, this is a time-lapse video, and these are spores, the white little things were spores, and you can see the vegetative cells, this is bacillus, germinating out of them. Let's briefly talk about the clinical significance of spore-forming bacteria. As I mentioned earlier, Clostridium difficile is perhaps the most critical of these. It is responsible for a large portion of what are called nosocomial infections. Nosocomial infections are infections that you get when you're in a hospital setting. In other words, you went into the hospital with something else and then you acquired the infection in the hospital. The most common nosocomial infection might be staph, but C. diff is one that once you get it is really difficult to eradicate. One of the reasons why C. diff is so problematic is because it makes spores. And because it makes spores, you really can't effectively eradicate every single spore from a particular room. So if you have a patient with C. diff and they have a bunch of diarrhea, that bacteria is gonna get everywhere, including the spores. And while you might be able to kill off all the vegetative cells, you're probably not gonna be able to kill off all of the spores. 
which means that somebody that comes in and like touches a bed railing with C. diff or you know a gown with C. diff spores on it can easily pick up one or two spores and transfer them to another patient. And that is how this infection spreads. And as you can see here, it's a big problem in hospitals. And this is a great picture of a colonoscopy that has a raging C. diff infection. That is not normal. You should not have that type of um, what's called pseudomembrane colitis in your colon. Your colon should be nice and pink, not looking like it's got plaque everywhere. So that is, that's bad, really bad. In addition to the clinical importance, there is also the potential for bioterrorism. So bioterrorism is using things like viruses and bacteria as a way of basically genocide, killing off other people. And one agent that was used in 2001 is Bacillus anthracis. Now, you may not be old enough to remember this, but shortly after the 9-11 terrorism attacks, certain senators were getting mail that um, contained anthrax spores. And the anthrax spores aerosolized, and then people would inhale this aerosolized powder that contained anthrax spores. When the anthrax spores would land in their lungs, they would germinate, and five people died from this bioterrorism. Now, the reason why anthrax was used in this particular case is because it is a spore former. If anthrax was not a spore former, it would not have persisted in dry powder that could easily be mailed. So spore formers tend to be good candidates for bioterrorism, unfortunately. All right, that concludes our lecture on endosporulation. I hope you learned something. Thanks so much.